Hello, everyone. Hello. We made it. Wednesday, where are we at? December 16th. Um, so, uh, how's everybody? Good. Yeah, glad to hear it. Trying to get through finals. Tis the season. Me too. I'm ready for this semester to be over. It's been a long one. Um, so logistics for this class, wrapping up the semester, Kappa up due tomorrow. Um, final exam, uh, final exam, midterm number four. It's really just another midterm uh, on Friday. Um, this will work the following. Um, there is, yeah, question. There, no, I'm not gonna have a reflective writing this week. Thanks for asking. Your, your assignment this week is if you've missed one in the past, go back and, and do the ones you've missed. Um, as far as the final goes on Friday, um, I will open it up. I'm gonna have to make, a quiz, make it a quiz. It's an assignment now. I'm gonna have to make a quiz called exam four. Uh, I will post that in the usual place in the modules where it says Friday. I'll post it under there. I think there's assignments there now. I'll replace that with the quiz when I get it up. It will be a timed exam. Um, when you have access to the, oh, there is no class Monday, no. There is no class Friday. Um, so Friday, we will not meet, this is our last actual class meeting. I mean, you can ignore those, those Friday and Monday ones. Um, so, so there will be a, a, a final exam quiz that, is, that is avail become, becomes available at 8 a.m. On, on Friday morning. Um, you can click on that link and there will be, you know, a, a space in there to actually enter the exam. Once you enter the exam, it will say, do you want to start? This will start the timer. Uh, the, the clock will start. There'll be a PDF in there, which is, which will look very similar to the PDFs that you've had in your hands before. Um, and you will be um, working on problems on a separate sheet of paper. It can be lined. I don't care. Um, so you will have, I'm actually going to give every, it's, it, I, I anticipate making an exam that's about the same length as the other three midterm exams. So it should be able to be finished in about 50 minutes. I'm going to give everyone 75 minutes for this particular exam. Um, because that is going to include, so you'll have a little bit of extra time, um, 25 extra minutes, 50% longer, in fact. Um, but just be aware that some of that time does include the time that it's going to take to scan and upload a PDF copy of the work that you've done, which is what I'm actually going to be grading. There is no, you know, it's going to be just writing it out as you normally would if you were taking the exam on a piece of paper. I just want scanned copies of those before handed in um, for your for your record. Now, um, know that that's going to take a little bit of time, and that 75 minutes includes the the, the the clock will stop at 75 minutes, and you won't be able to upload everything after that 75 minutes. So you should probably think of this as a 60. You have 65 minutes to take this exam, and 10 minutes to figure out how to scan and upload that that document to Canvas. Um, do not wait until two minutes before the 75 minutes to start uploading your stuff or you might not have time. Um, if you need help, you know, you should practice, you know, making quick PDF documents uh, of, of, your, of, your, of your written work. Um, Cam Scanner is a free app that works very well to uh, make very legible and readable PDF documents out of things that you take a pictures of. So it's a free app. Um, uh, if anybody thinks they're gonna have a problem scanning their things, please let me know before Friday and we'll try to figure it out. Um, but that is, that is the, the real thing you need to know. You'll have 75 minutes, but that includes time at the end to scan and upload. Um, it's, if you've taken the exams this way before, that's not how it worked in the past. You had your 50 minutes and then I sort of left it open. You could, you could upload it, you know, 10, 15 minutes later. That's not how this is going to work. You, that 75 minutes is more than norm, you normally have. Um, and it should include plenty of time. 
uh, to finish the exam, but you're, it includes the time that you're going to need to actually upload the exam um, to P in PDF form. Um, other than that, it's going to be a um, an exam like the others. Um, did I mention anything about? No, I, this this will be an exam like like the others. So so no outside collaboration with anybody else. Um, uh, yeah. Do I care if you use outside resources? Let me let me think about that. Let me think about that and get back to you. I, I know nobody asked that question, but it just came up to my I have done these kinds of things, open note, open book in the past, but let me let me let me decide on that and let you know by the end of the day. Are there other questions about final exam or anything else? Logistics wise? by the end of the class. Right, so, right, so good question. I, I didn't mention that. Um, are you able to take it anytime as Friday? Y yes, um, unless there's an objection and I could see this going late, although I'm not gonna be around to be taking any questions or resolving any problems after eight, certainly. Um, I, I, had, I had planned on shutting it down at 8, 8 p.m. Um, so a 12 hour window between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. Um, so any 75 minute window in that time. Um, that answer the question? Okay. Um, and then we won't meet at all next Monday. Um, hopefully I'll have grades all done by then. Um, if you do want to uh, redo any of the uh, I'm gonna say I'm gonna say Friday at eight at midnight is the deadline to redo any of the old um, uh, reflective writing assignments that you have not yet finished. Uh, I'll be locking those in then and you know going through them and grading them um, over the weekend. So um, I think that's it. Any other questions? Okay. Then today is just a wrap up day. Um, we've only got four, 13 people here anyway. Uh, I've got one topic that's more of an information session. This, I, this actually isn't even gonna be covered on the exam, but I think that Dr. Iyer is gonna expect you to have seen this at some level this semester when you start Hamlet 4 in January. Um, so let me not get on Dr. Iyer's bad side and actually introduce this concept right now. Uh, hey, this is working great. I even got some new whiteboard, black whiteboard markers. So once it's a, it should be in great shape. Okay, so that um, concept is the Compton effect. Um, this is another, you know, this, you know, this last portion of this class is a series of experiments talking about a series of experiments that sort of led to quantum mechanics and next semester is going to be all about those more of those experiments and actually developing the basics of quantum mechanics itself um, so Compton effect certainly falls into that category so the year is 1922 uh, a dude by the name of Compton is studying photons scattering off of electrons So here is the picture. Uh, let me see if I can do this. There it is. This is this is the picture. Oops, this is the picture to have in your head. Um, so uh, incident X-ray photon comes in hits an electron that's at rest relative to, um, relative, well, at, at rest in some, in its own reference frame, obviously. Um, that incident X-ray bounces at some level off of that electron. The electron goes flying off in one direction. 
and the photon goes flying off in a different direction than it hit the electron at. And the interesting thing about this, um, I mean, there's lots of interesting things about this particular reaction, uh, but one of them is that the wavelength of the photon that is emitted, that bounces off in this direction, changes from the incident wavelength of the photon. So two things happen. Incident wavelength comes in, interacts with this electron, electron goes flying off in one direction, photon goes flying off in another direction, energy and therefore wavelength of this photon changes, and some energy obviously is, is um, transmitted to this recoil electron uh, as it goes flying off in this direction. That's the basics of the Compton effect. Um, and what Compton realized is that he could not explain the incoming photon, the incoming light, and the um, energies of the outgoing electron and x-rays unless he treated this like a billiards ball problem, unless he treated that photon like a particle. So let's think about how, how we're actually gonna do this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna draw this a little bit here too. Incoming photon with some wavelength and frequency that are obviously related to one another, hits some electron, which goes flying off in this direction with some angle, let's say phi, and then the photon goes off in some other direction with some angle, let's say theta, at some new wavelength and some new frequency. So the wavelength of the photon changes, And in fact, it depends, it's dependent on the angle of scattering. So let's think about energy conservation for this particular interaction. The energy beforehand, right? The, the energy is the energy of the photon plus the energy of the electron, right? So the energy of the photon is just Planck's constant times the frequency of that photon. The energy of the electron is just the, it's at rest. So it's just the rest mass energy of the electron. It is Me mass of the electron times C squared. Um, and that has to be equal to the energy, the total energy after the interaction, right? This is the total energy before the interaction. After the interaction, we've got the new energy of the photon. Let's say H times the new frequency. I'll call, I, don't, I, don't, I think that the book does this. We could call that F prime, but they call it F bar. So I'll just stick with their notation and call it F bar. And this is plus the new energy of the electron, whatever that is. That's going to be. It's going to involve some rest mass energy, obviously, still, and it's going to involve some kinetic energy, too, because it's now it's moving off in some direction. We can also think about momentum conservation. This is just like a billiards ball problem, right? You have a, the billiard ball, the photon coming in and bouncing off the electron. Uh, and scattering it in some particular direction. And the energy uh, outgoing is gonna be dependent obviously on the angle of, 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 of incidence and on the incoming energy. So uh, we need to do momentum conservation in two dimensions. Let's call this X and this Y. So in X, um, the initial momentum is uh, just the energy over C, H, HF over C the energy of a photon, the momentum of a photon, and, and the electron has zero momentum at the beginning. So this is the total momentum of the system beforehand. And afterwards, we've got the momentum of the um, photon, 
which is HF bar over C, where F bar is the new frequency, but this is not anymore in, in, in purely in the X direction, right? So we have a cosine theta term here. Plus the momentum of the electron after the case. I'm not, I'm not even gonna put up, oh, this is the momentum. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a vector sign, it's a bar. The momentum of the electron after the collision, obviously it was zero before the collision, times again, a cosine of a different angle, which is the angle that the electron went flying off in the other direction. In Y, we know that the initial momentum of this system in, in the Y direction was zero. So we've got zero beforehand, and afterwards, we've got these same two terms, except we get the sine theta instead of the cosine theta. And the sine phi instead of the cosine phi. Right, so we can, this is a purely billiards ball kind of things. Also, we know that the total energy of the electron squared after the collision is equal to its momentum squared times c squared plus me c squared squared. This is one of our equations from, from the last class or relating momentum and energy. So you've got four equations, one, two, three, four equations and five unknowns, four equations, five unknowns. What are our unknowns? Our unknowns are, we know, let's say we know the incoming wavelength and frequency. We, our five unknowns are the outgoing frequency, the outgoing energy of the electron, the outgoing momentum of the electron, and these two angles, theta and phi. So given some angle, you can solve for everything else. So let's say you've got some, some grid of electrons and you're shining x-rays at it, and you know which direction the x-rays are coming in at, and you observe a, an electron that's been scattered at some angle. Once you know that angle, that that, that uh, you only know one of these five to get the other four exactly. That will give you exactly what phi has to be, exactly what the momentum and energy of the electron afterwards have to be, and exactly what the frequency of that photon had, has to be, just given conservation of energy and, and, and momentum. And, and that equation is, I've run out of room, I'm gonna write it up here the Compton effect equation. And that is that the new wavelength of the photon, this is, of course, I put frequency down here, but since frequency and wavelength are just related by the speed of light, you can easily turn this into a wavelength. And that's usually what we're measuring anyway. Um, the, way, the new wavelength of the photon after, actually, let me put some bars in here so that we're consistent in notation, equals the wavelength before plus, H over Me, mass of the electron times C, times one minus cosine theta. Right? It has to go to our large, larger wavelength, which is a smaller energy because some of the energy that was in that photon has been absorbed by the electron as, and caused it to move off in a particular direction. So this is the Compton effect equation. It can only be you can only make sense of this particular interaction if you assume that a photon is just a particle. It's just a billiard ball coming in and bouncing off of the electron and imparting some energy on it. Um, Compton uh, himself won the Nobel Prize for this, for working out the theory behind what was going on with this interaction uh, in 1927, so five years after he published the results. So um, that's the Compton effect. And it's one of many, you'll, you'll hear this sometimes as Compton scattering. 
incoming x-rays are scattered off of, of uh, particles, typically electrons. Um, and the angle is proportional to the energy um, of the, um, the energy of the scattered electron or scattered photon. So um, that is it. We've got almost a half an hour left in this class. Um, I'm happy to take questions on pretty much anything. Uh, class, homework, reflective writing, life, COVID, vaccinations, mental health. The floor is open. What do you want to talk about? Um, I have a question kind of about last class, about the uh, sort of about general relativity. Um, you were mentioning how obviously mass and energy uh, are bending space time and that that it can affect light because light has some energy. And, you know, I kind of assume that also implied, does that mean light also bends space time, even though it's massless? Probably. Um... That's so, so. Is that the question, or is there a follow-up question? No, that's that's the question. That's I, the question. I, I yeah. This is a this up. is a great this is a great question. Um, can do photons bend space-time? Um, again, my limit my knowledge of this subject is is pretty surface level, so I, I'm probably missing some insight. But my understanding is that um, without some I mean, I, I think the answer, I think most people, most general relativists would, would say yes, photons do bend light. Um, but I, I think that there is no formal solution to that issue yet. Um, and I think that part of the issue is that um, photons are weird particles anyway, because they travel at the speed of light and there is no proper reference frame for things traveling at the speed of light. I mean, think about Time dilates, you know, as you get cl closer and closer and closer to the speed of light, time dilates more and more and more and more. And it turns out that if you are a particle traveling at the speed of light, time sort of stops to being a thing for you. Like, like you can't even really talk about what time is if you're traveling at the speed of light, right? Um, because what reference frame could you possibly, there, there, is, no, there, there is no proper reference frame for a thing traveling the speed of light, because no nothing else can 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 transport to that frame, right? So uh, time itself becomes an issue, and so I think that muddles every other formalism that you would try to make for light bending around a, a particle that was traveling that fast. Um, but the other the other complication is this: um, I think without a quantum level view of what's going on with gravity. We can't really even talk about you know what's happening at, at the photon level. You know what I mean? So uh, we don't we don't really understand the force mechanisms that causes space to be curved. We assume that there's probably some force carrying particle, like sort of like the photon is the force carrying particle of the of the electromagnetic force. There's probably some graviton that's the force carrying particle of the mag of the gravitational force that causes this warpage of space time but we don't have any formal theory for how that works yet. Um, and so I think this is a fairly, I, I don't think there's a definitive answer to that question. It's a good one though. I, I hope that was helpful. Oh yeah, thank and I, you. And I, also, and I also hope it was right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wow, it's fun to think about. Really. It, is, it, is, it, is, it is some crazy stuff to think about indeed. It's a good question. Anything else? Anybody uh, have any crazy? Oh, oh, go ahead. Uh, just for, I was like doing homework, and I think I'm not quite understanding equations from yesterday because I feel like hit a wall on like problems four and five, and every other problem seems to build on those. So <laughs> I've just, I got the first three, I was like, okay, this makes sense. And then it just hit a wall at four, and I'm like, I'm not understanding that kinetic energy equation. <laughs> okay, um, let me remind myself what four and five were. 
ah, the velocity of an object that has two and a half times as much kinetic energy as rest energy, right? So um, this is, um, you know, just the, the, the new definition of kinetic energy that we, that we wrote down during last class, right? So let's, let's uh, are you still seeing my board? I think you are, yes. Um, so what equation do we write down for kinetic energy? We wrote down this one, kinetic energy equals gamma mc squared minus mc squared. That's the new kinetic energy of a particle moving at relativistic energy. Um, and the rest mass energy is just mc squared. So um, really what they're saying is in four, let's say, what is the velocity of an object that has, let's say, n times as much kinetic energy as the rest energy? Well, um, if the kinetic energy is n times the rest mass energy, that's just going to give you an equation like this. Right? So, um, you know, this is just k, which is gamma times mc squared minus mc squared divided by e naught, which is just mc squared. That has to be equal to n. The mc squared just go away. Um, and you can solve this for gamma. And then once you know what gamma is, uh, you can uh, solve for beta. And once you know what beta is, that's, that's the answer. Okay, that makes sense. So E naught is rest energy. I think I was just getting confused with terms. I didn't have them written down properly. Over. That's right. Rest, the rest energy is just mc squared. Okay. And then five is, you know, five is similar. You've got you've got some some mass on on the before, and you've got some mass on after, right? In terms of rest mass, right? So you've got some rest mass energy of your of your uh, original particle, and then you've got the rest mass energy of the two particles that that happen at, at the other end uh, after after the decay. They're not going to be the same. If you add up the total rest mass energy of the before and the total rest mass energy of the after, they're not going to be the same. And in fact, the rest mass of the after is going to be a little bit less than the rest mass of the, of the before. Well, that rest mass, that, that energy can't be destroyed, right? That energy has to have gone somewhere. And the only place it can go is into the kinetic energy of the particles that are leaving. And so this really is number five is just how much energy do you have left over when you take this and subtract this from it? That has to be the total kinetic energy there, therefore, in the in the in the in the, in the, in the K products. Does that make sense? This is an energy conservation argument for number five. Okay, so you just found so you found the rest mass for the first set, and then the rest mass, the energy of the first set, and then the energy of the second sets, and just take the delta of that, and that's K. That the delta of that has to be K. It's okay. the only other place it can go. Yep. And it's basically the same for number six, except now you're talking about all the protons and neutrons separately. And all those digits are important because, you know, there, there's very small, you're taking deltas of, of numbers that are very close together. So don't, don't skimp on the significant figures on these problems. So for six, though, we would just use the binding, the energy binding, which is the sum of all the pro, sum of all the protons and neutrons minus the total mass of the atom in question, or yeah, yeah, something like that. That's right. Okay. That's right. Because I'm I'm looking at the formula sheet now for for example, and that's one of the equations on there. That's right. That's right. Yep. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Anybody have any exciting plans for the break? You get a month and a half off. It's kind of nice. I uh, was looking at degree works the other day, and I saw that there's actually this, um, if I take enough geology classes, there's this class on dinosaurs that hopefully I'll be able to take. That sounds like a lot of fun. 
That does sound like fun. Is it taught by Dr. Over? Uh, I don't know who it's taught by, and I wouldn't be able to take it until senior year, but um, I was checking the course description. Apparently, there's like an eight-day field trip where we're going to look at fossils and like maybe do some archaeology. And like, I don't, I don't know what could be like, that sounds like so much fun. That sounds amazing. Um, the geology department does some fantastic field trips. I don't know how they're handling it this year. I'm sure they've had to cancel some of them. But in, in normal times, every other year, they do a January trip where they'll be gone for a month and they'll go to Chile or New Zealand or Utah or some crazy place, Iceland, where there's just crazy geology going on. And they'll, you know, all the faculty will go and any student who wants, to, who's in the junior or senior year goes and they just learn geology on site in these amazing places. I'm actually kind of jealous. So the geology department here does some, some very cool stuff. Um, and geophysics is a real is a real major, and uh, we have, you know, if you're if you're interested in that kind of thing, um, you know, it's not that hard to either minor in geology or switch to a geophysics program uh, major, um, if that's if that's really something you're interested in. So yeah, definitely, and and all the geology professors are amazing. So um, you know, they're they're almost as good as the physics department. And dinosaurs are pretty cool. I mean, not as cool as black holes, maybe, but but they're pretty cool. Right, but now I'm at this amazing point where I can study both black holes and dinosaurs. Right, why choose? You can do both. There's gotta be a connection there somewhere. I'll keep looking. I guess it isn't the season for uh, for fun trips. I, I will tell you a sad story. Um, about this time last year, um, my mother and brother and I started planning like let's let's just go to Hawaii. Let all three, all, you know, my mother, my brother's family, and I. Let's just go to Hawaii for a week uh, and stay at at Kauai and rent a house and just hike around the island and snorkel. And uh, that was actually going to happen. Would have had we we booked a place we were ready to go and then and then the pandemic hit and we had to cancel it all so we would it would be that I would be leaving like next Thursday a week from tomorrow for to go to Hawaii for a week um, so I'm a little bit a little bit sad for that um, but I think we're going to try to reschedule for next year so um, I probably would have won the coolest winter trip vacation plan but you know. COVID, what are you gonna do? Well, if you keep planning for every year, then eventually it's gotta happen, right? Eventually it's gotta happen, right? I'm told by people who know that um, probably by, well, what was the latest thing? By April or May of this year, herd immunity will start to have taken effect in the US. And that by next fall, things should be about back to normal. So that's that's that makes me hopeful that by next next winter break, we'll uh, we'll be in good shape to be traveling again. Dr. Steinauer, yeah, um, what is the coolest telescope you looked through? <laughs> oh man, that's that's usually a crazy question, but it's actually not. So um, I have so looked through right. When you yeah. go to a professional observatory, you don't really look through telescopes, right? Um, you know, these things are, you know, the big one that we go to at Kitt Peak in, in Arizona is three and a half meters in diameter, right? That's the that's the diameter of the primary mirror, three and a half meters, which is, I don't know, 12, 10 feet, 11 feet in diameter. This is a huge, it's just a huge telescope, right? So you don't, you don't, there is no eyepiece. You don't look through it. Um, you're sitting at a at a terminal down below the telescope, um, and you're you're controlling it, and you're taking images, and you're taking you're getting those images mailed uh, shipped. Not not mailed. You're downloading those images from the camera, and you're looking at them on monitors. Right. Um, however, 
Um, this was probably, I don't know, 20 years ago. Um, and we have the second half of a night on the three and a half meter telescope. And um, the first half of the night was reserved for a tour given for rich people who we were hoping would make a donation to the observatory. And for occasions like that, they actually pull out an eyepiece and put it on the telescope, right? So they have to take an entire instrument off the telescope that is useful for scientific observations and put this eyepiece on there in order to make this work. But for special occasions like this, every now and then they do it. Um, and so they, you know, our, our, our half of the night was scheduled to start at 1230. And at about 11 o'clock, they wrapped up with what they were doing. So we had about an hour and a half uh, where there was no, you know, we didn't have any plan. We didn't, you know, the telescope time wasn't even ours anymore at that point uh, to just to just look at cool stuff through a three and a half meter telescope. So I have, it's probably still the coolest thing I've ever done. Um, so, you know, you pointed it at, at Jupiter and you can see like a lot, you know, first of all, the, the eyepiece is huge. It's like this big, you put your whole face up to it, um, which, was, which was amazing in itself. Um, but you can see like individual swirls in the clouds bands of, of Jupiter. Uh, we, we pointed at Saturn, you could see multiple breaks in the rings of Saturn. You could see on Jupiter, the shadow of one of the moons on, on, on the surface of the planet itself. We looked at a, an edge on galaxy and you can just see amazing detail in the, in the dust lanes of, of the galaxy itself. The thing that struck me the most was though, we looked at a planetary nebula, which you don't know what planetary nebula is. It's a star like the sun at the end of its life that, sh that sheds its outer atmosphere and, and then it glows. Um, and I had seen pictures of these things, obviously lots of times. And this was just a nondescript one. It was perfectly circular. But the thing that you don't get usually when you look through a telescope is color because you, it takes a lot more light to activate the, I don't know if it's the rods or the cones, the ones that gives you the color. Usually if you're in a very low light situation, you're just seeing black and white because that's the, what the low, low sensitivity part of your eye detector is. Um, this thing was vivid aquamarine blue. I could not believe how colorful this planetary nebula was just sitting there in space. Uh, there was so much light, there were so many photons getting collected by this thing that they could actually trigger the color receptors in your eyes. It was spectacular. Um, if you ever have a chance to look through a three and a half meter telescope, please do it. It's amazing. Um, that's not the biggest telescope I've used though. Uh, also about 20 years ago, um, uh, I and my then thesis advisor uh, had time on, or, or, or had a collaborator who worked at the University of Hawaii who had time on the Keck 10 meter telescope. And that is not the world's biggest telescope anymore, but I think at the time it was the world's biggest telescope, world's biggest optical telescope. Um, and so that was cool. We flew out to Hawaii, the big island, um, and you know, did some tourism stuff, but for three nights were using the world's biggest telescope to take spectra of, of very cool objects. Um, so that was, that's the biggest telescope I've used, but I actually have looked through a three and a half meter telescope and it was, it was amazing. Good question. Uh, that sounds awesome. It's spectacular. Do that one day. So is that your, is there a dream telescope to visit then or? The one in Hawaii? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, it doesn't get much better than the Keck telescopes, although, you know, and, and, and you know, a lot of the bit modern telescopes that are being built these days are, are dedicated survey telescopes. So, for instance, I am looking very much forward to the Vera Rubin Observatory opening in the next year or two. Um, it used to be called the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. And this isn't going to, you know, you're not going to, you know, most telescopes in the past, you would, you know, there, there's a call for proposals, right? And you write a proposal and you say, I want to observe this object uh, because of this scientific reason. And then some, some committee decides which are the best reasons and assigns. And then some telescope time allocation committee, you know, gives you certain nights. Um, that's 
the old way of doing things, the new way of doing things is let's build a telescope that just observes everything and let's make that available, data available to the public. So what, what the Vera Rubin telescope is gonna do is take a, every three days, it will have a complete image of every part of the sky down to some real, it's an eight meter set class telescope, down to some really faint limit in, in three different filters which is gonna completely change astronomy as we know it. Um, you know, you won't have to go to the telescope to make, make um, you know, to take images of, of, of things anymore unless you have a very specific filter that you need because they'll be available all the time. You'll be able to find transients, things that are moving in real time. You'll be able to, you know, transients like supernovae and other things, interesting things that, that go off every three days. You'll have a complete cycle of, of everything. Um, and so it's going to change the way that a lot of a lot of astronomy is done. Uh, now, they're also building to follow up on that, right? You need th that's going to be the imaging, you know, how bright are things? But you're going to need spectroscopic follow up, right? What are the, you know, what what is the spectrum of these very interesting objects? And so they're also in the in the midst of building a 30 meter telescope. You know, the Keck is a 10 meter diameter mirror. The next generation of telescopes are going to have 30 meter diameter mirrors. So light gathering power goes as the diameter of a mirror of, of your of your telescope squared so a, a 30 meter telescope is is almost a order of magnitude more sensitive to light you gather almost an order of magnitude more light than a, than a 10 meter class telescope does so um that's gonna a lot you know change again some fundamental way we do things and and open some windows that have just never never been open before like you know maybe imaging getting direct images of Earth-like exoplanets. Those, those are the goals. Maybe taking a spectrum of, of the atmosphere of an Earth-like exoplanet and seeing if there's oxygen in the atmosphere. You know, things like that start to become possible with a 30-meter with a telescope. Um, but again, the way astronomy is done is, is changing. And so it used to be, if you wanted to go to, to observe at this telescope, you would have to you know, get on a plane and go to that telescope and take the observations in real time and bring them back and work on them. Um, the way these, you know, obviously that doesn't work with the Hubble Space Telescope or any space telescope, but but more and more other observatories are going to a model where the there are professional observers on site who know the instruments inside and out, take the data that you request, process it in the best possible way, and then send you the data results. And so I have a feeling that's certainly the way that most people observe with the Keck telescopes now. Um, and it, I have a feeling it's gonna be the way that the only way of observing really with these new 30 meter class telescopes. So you're gonna, you, again, you'll write a proposal, they'll rank them, they'll decide which ones deserve to be observed, but you won't actually go on that night. You'll just eventually get sent the data after it gets taken. Very interesting. It's cool stuff. Got about five minutes left. Anything else you want to know? This is like a, an ask me anything, I guess. Um, I guess I have a question. Um, so I'm assuming you've probably gone on trips with the physics department. Are there any that were like really memorable to you? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, have I gone on? So the physics department has taken trips, but I wouldn't say that the entire physics department in my time here, and I've been here 15 plus years, the entire department went on a trip somewhere, like the geology department does say. Um, now, that said, there are trips that happen during the year sometimes. Sometimes like the physics club has gone to the Corning Museum of Glass or the physics, the astronomy club has gone up to visit the telescopes uh, at RIT or, or visit the, pla the, the planetarium at the Rochester Museum Science Center. Um, but, you know, or some subset of research students will go to a conference, right? Maybe all the Patalino students will go to uh, the, the DPT meeting, DPP meeting. Um, but I don't, you know, I, we haven't really done a trip like the geology department does uh, in that way. 
Uh, maybe we should think about doing that sometime. Uh, there used to be a, you know, back before I got here in the early 2000s, maybe even 1990s, I think that there was a faculty member who owned a cabin in the Pennsylvania woods. And I think once a summer, they they would invite everybody down who wanted to go and, you know, there would you know, be a huge gathering at, at, at that cottage. Um, but that doesn't happen anymore either because that faculty member has retired. Um, my my most memorable trips are to telescopes with students, but that's certainly not an entire faculty thing. Uh, there was one trip where uh, my me and my students and Pellerin and Pellerin students all went to a conference. Maybe I'm misremembering things. Anyway, I've taken students to lots of conferences too, national conferences, like Washington DC and Seattle and Austin, Texas, and those are always those are always a lot of fun. If you have a chance to go to a professional conference, you should probably you should you should take advantage of it. Um, you know, it's intimidating. I'm I'm an introvert. I, you know, it intimidates me to be in a room with, you know, Nobel Prize winners just walking by. Um, but you know, there's always, um, you know, very interesting talks that are given at the you know sort of base expert level, so you can kind of understand what's going on by some of the leading figures in the world, and so. You know, even these big conferences are very cool to go to. And there's always lots of cool swag, like all of the space companies will have will have um, booths set up, NASA will have a booth set up. You know, you'll see big mock-ups of the new space telescopes and they'll be giving out posters and it's a lot of fun. Um, so if you ever have a chance to do that, go to a conference. I would I would take advantage of that too. Um, but uh, But no, we haven't, you know, what are some ideas? Where would you want to go? If we took a if we took a department physics trip somewhere, where should we go? Um, well, so I did end up like transferring schools to here, but um, in my one semester that I was there, the like, I guess you could say the physics club, we went to FizCon in Providence, Rhode Island. And yeah. I don't know. I mean, it happens like in different places every single year. And I don't think it happen at a place this year but i mean if it ever was to be close by i think that would be something really interesting to yeah stop by. What, what was your what was your previous school um suffolk university in boston yeah yeah yeah, yeah. cool um yeah there was there was talk of having a contingent go to that i don't remember what happened in the end um but yeah it sounds like you need to be a part of physics club because that is a cool idea and you should make it happen because money is available if you want to do these things, right? Uh, you just need to get people excited about it. So that's a great idea. I do know that every year we send, the department sends people to QWIP, which is the Council on Undergraduate Women in Physics. And they, every year they have a, um, a conference. You don't have to be a woman to go. You can be, it, it, it's open to anybody. Um, but there are there are regional conferences all over the place, and I know that we send students there every every year. Uh, now this may be an exception, obviously, in a pandemic, but um, that does happen. And I know that I don't know that faculty have ever gone, but I do know that students have gone every year and and come back raving about the experience. It's sort of the same thing. You're networking, you're meeting people, you're getting inspired by amazing people's stories and and what they've achieved and how they've achieved it. Um, so, um, yeah, that definitely uh, yeah. sounds interesting. So, yeah, but get involved in physics club is kind of floundering right now. I know that there are some people who are, I think even who are in this class right now on, on this class who are, who, are, who are charging forward to take up the mantle of bringing the physics club back from the dead. Yes, Nicole! please shout us out. We need more people. We, yeah, we have I, people, but we would love more participants because VizCon fantastic. sounds doable. <laughs> yeah, I think that's totally doable. So um, get involved. Be be a part of be a part of your department. Um, the more the more the merrier. Yeah, I, um, I attended the interest meeting, so Excellent. hopefully we can start getting more meetings in next semester. I'm excited about that. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. yeah this this is this. Sophomore class has to pick up the mantle because the junior and senior class have kind of dropped the ball. Okay, well, it's 2.20. Um, we're at the end of our time together. Um, uh, it's been a fun class. 
uh, it's been weird. Um, I haven't liked it, you know, the, the whole remote nature of it, but we've muddled through. Um, hopefully we've learned some things along the way. Uh, good luck on my exam. Good luck on all your exams. If you have questions, you can let me know. Um, and uh, have a great break. Thank you. Have a good Thank holiday. You. Thank you so much. Thank uh, you so much. Thank you. You, you too. Have a nice break. Thank you. Thanks.